Welcome to a special edition of Dialogue on the Unfolding Crisis in Ukraine. I want to thank you for joining us. My name is Trevor Brown. I'm Dean of Ohio State University's John Glenn College of Public Affairs, and I'm going to be moderating our conversation today. Before we get started, I want to run through a few quick Zoom housekeeping notes. First, all attendees are in listen and view only mode, which means you can see and hear us, but we can't see and hear you. Second, closed captions are available for this webinar. You can click the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen to turn captions on and off. We are recording this program, so please be aware that uh, it is being recorded. And we will take questions throughout our conversation. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions during the program. If someone posts a question you like, you can upvote it by clicking the thumbs up icon beneath the question. Now, just a little bit about this series and what to expect today. Dialogue is a collaboration between WOSU Public Media and the John Glenn College of Public Affairs that has developed into a robust speaker series featuring top names in media, politics, and current affairs discussing the issues affecting our community and our nation. Our topic today is the Russian invasion of Ukraine, something, an event that has captured the attention of the world, both world leaders and citizens around the globe. Joining me for our discussion is Dr. Scott Smitson, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, retired, Professor of Geostrategy and Geoeconomics at the Joint Special Operation University, whose career in the Army involved providing strategic guidance to decision makers about security threats around the globe and Dr. Lucan Ahmed Way, Professor of Political Science, Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto, a scholar who's devoted much of his career to understanding the trajectory of authoritarianism and democracy in Russia and Ukraine. Scott and Lucan, thank you for joining us and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. So this is a complicated event in a multi-layered situation. I have too many questions to ask and have you answer in the time we have available. And I know our audience will have many questions as well. Still, we're gonna endeavor to do our best to help explain what's happening, identify the implications and look to where things might go from here. I wanna try to organize the conversation in three parts. First, uh, to try and get an understanding of what's happening now and where the conflict might go. Then second, look and explore the implications for geopolitics, the relationships between specific individual nations and multilateral organizations like the UN, the EU, NATO. And then finally, in the third part, finish by speculating what this means for the state of democracy, autocracy, and the, the liberal world order. So let's start then with that current state of the invasion. And I'm gonna start with you, Lucan. As someone who knows the history of Russia and Ukraine, as well as developments over the last three decades since the fall of the Soviet Union, were you surprised by Putin's invasion of Ukraine, as well as the timing and the scale? Well, I would say yes and no. Um, I think, I mean, and mostly yes. Uh, in terms of why this is, you know, this invasion is conceivable, um, I think those of us who've spent time in the region, and I've lived both extensive periods of time in, in Ukraine as well as Moscow, is that many of the Moscow elite really do not understand Ukraine and really you know, do not understand that there is a separate Ukrainian nationhood that is quite strong. And I've always been struck by their sort of delusional uh, quality of their, of their attitude towards Ukraine and also their territorial designs on Ukraine. So that aspect of it is, you know, and clearly is not surprising and clearly Putin's invasion as he made clear in his speech on February 24th, first is part of that tradition of great Russian power. I mean, this is a crudely imperialist act in a way that we haven't really seen in, in many decades. It, at the same time, it's also surprising because, you know, Putin was someone who everybody thought and rightly so was fairly cautious. This was someone who had, you know, cared deeply um, about his public image. Um, he would sort of anything that sort of, you know, like pension reform that was at all going to sort of disrupt his image, he shied away from. Uh, furthermore, while he has shown in 2008 in Georgia 
and Ukraine in 2014, his willingness to engage in military action, they were all sort of centered on parts of uh, the former Soviet Union that were clearly already fairly Russophile. Um, and, you know, you know, you know, he could make the plausible claim, I think, in um, Abkhazia, Ossetia, in Georgia, and also uh, Crimea in Ukraine, that there was at least a plausible case to be made that those populations um, might have supported Russian actions. And this is, you know, a really radical break from that. It is clearly very risky. He's clearly going in regions that even by his own, you know, measure, I'm sure, in Western Ukraine, you know, are clearly very anti-Russian. So this is, you know, in that sense, it is a surprise, you know, it is quite a surprise. Um, so it's both, yeah. Great, thank you, Luke. And Scott, I want to turn to you. As a student of security threats around the globe, have you been surprised by the resiliency of Ukrainians, both its citizenry and the military? And what explains how the Ukrainians have been able to adeptly respond to what is purportedly an overwhelmingly superior military force? So Trevor, thanks for, thanks for that question, and Luke, and you know, for your opening comments as well. So I, I think what we're really seeing is, as we said before, a true sense of a unique Ukrainian political identity. And that identity is manifest in that you have an entire society that's willing to resist on purpose to defend those moral and political uh, uh, principles that, that, that are tied to that identity, right? Um, and so I think one of the things that you've seen that separates maybe the events of 2014 to what we're seeing now is in the last seven years, Ukraine, in partnership with many countries, to, to, to include the United States, have really tried to reinvigorate their security institutions, but also alarming and awakening their entire society about the challenge from Russia. Just last year, Ukraine changed their constitution to make sure that every citizen knew that they had a constitutional responsibility to resist any invasion or occupation. So that the seed corn of what we're seeing manifest right now is a combination of a unique Ukrainian political identity, an evolution of Ukraine's domestic politics, the role of its citizens, and how countries like the United States and others, to include NATO, have been building up this capability for Ukraine in ways that, 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 that really is, is changing and, and fundamentally challenging the assumptions of what uh, the Kremlin thought would be an in and out blitzkrieg type operation. And it's nothing like that at all. Thanks, Scott. Look, I want to turn back to you. Um, again, as a student of, of Russia and perhaps of Putin, what, what do you think success looks like for, for Putin and for Russia? And what do you see as, as Putin and Russia's goals with this intervention? Well, I think its its original goals are very clear. You know, he stated, you know, explicitly he wants to eliminate Ukraine as a nation. He wants to take over Ukraine. Um, and it's clear, as uh, was mentioned, that he expected, you know, Ukraine to fall like a house of cards. And obviously that has not happened. So it is really quite hard to know, uh, you know, there's no plan B right here. And that's part of what's so terrifying about this event, that um, it's obvious that one, uh, Putin, you know, really is not sort of genetically capable of, you know, compromise at this point. He's clearly sort of set his entire, you know, you know, legacy on this war. At the same time, it's also extraordinarily clear that that Ukraine will never submit. So really, what you have here is just quite terrifying, and is you know, the recipe for a very long, drawn out, and extraordinarily bloody and catastrophic war. And that's really, you know, when I think about it, you know, that is the part that sort of just keeps me up at night. It's like, you know, I just cannot see how this ends outside of sort of an unlikely event, like a, a military coup in Russia. Trevor, so, can I, can I add, yeah. add, add one Please. thing to that too? So Luke and earlier talked about these series of kind of half or frozen conflicts that Putin uh, initiated going back to 2008 up until recently. And in each of those, his geopolitical objectives and games were not necessarily maximalist. He wasn't looking to go into Georgia and take over the entire country. Uh, when the, the projection of force into Syria was not about completely bringing complete control of Syria back to the Assad regime, only key locations. Uh, 
But what's different about this invasion is it's nothing but maximalist objectives. It's all or nothing. And as Lucan said, he has, he has enough force right now to close into major urban areas, to try to isolate Ukraine from the Black Sea and other, uh, other portions of neighboring countries, but not enough to combat a resistance. And, and it's getting to exactly what Lucan is, is saying or we're saying right now, is it, it, it leads you to where there's no suboptimal outcome for Putin. He either has to win or, or nothing. There's no half measures like in 2014. We are not in a 2014 Donetsk, Luhansk, Crimea space. This is a completely different uh, scenario right now. So this is to both of you. Uh, there's no way to use the term success for Ukraine, but what what does a pathway to some kind of peace look like for for Ukraine? Is there is there any scenario that allows re- Ukraine to return to stability as a sovereign nation? I think certainly in the long term, I think, you know, in some ways, you know, this is kind of a rebirth of the Ukrainian nation. I think, um, you know, all of us, you know, who study any, know anything about Ukraine knew that, you know, Western Ukrainians would do everything they could to resist a Russian incursion. That's not a surprise. But what's really kind of invigorating and inspiring is the places like Melitopol and, and Kherson in the south of Ukraine. This is supposed to be, you know, Putin's base. And yes, you know, the, the Russian military has been able to go into those territories, but there are daily protests or openly waving the Ukrainian flag right in front of the faces of, of Russian uh, soldiers. And so if, if, if the people in Melitopol are doing this, you can, you know, this is the South, this is the pro, quote unquote, pro-Russian part of Ukraine. You can only imagine the rest of the country. So Putin is in, yeah. Scott, go for it. So, so, so Trevor, to, just to build off Lucan's point, one of the other things that we're seeing, if, 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 if you study contentious politics, there's usually a series of factors that have to be in place for any type of resistance to, to win, to be successful. And we see all those manifest in Ukraine right now. You have a cause that people are, are, that are, are willing to fight and die for. It's a cause that, exclusive, that is not exclusive of anyone in society. So you have a major role for women women as moral authorities, women as active players, and you have a central figure that that the resistance can rally around. And you absolutely have that right now in President Zelensky in ways that I don't think anyone, especially those in Moscow, were counting on. So we have a we have a question in the chat. This is you can interpret this as the sort of maximalist question of what does Putin hope to gain, but maybe interpret this at the, the sort of more micro level. In the in the near term, what is what is Putin trying to gain in Ukraine? What resources? What are the specific strategic targets that he's after? Maybe I'll start with you, Scott. So so I, so I'll, I'll maybe I'll, I'll take a I'll, I'll I'll throw a few things out there. I think one from an operational perspective, if you looked in the areas that that Russia was able to kind of seize and claim in 2014, uh, Donetsk, Luhansk, and Crimea. Those weren't all obviously connected. The re- reason why the city Mariupol, as Lukin was talking about, is so key is if Russia takes that, you can then connect all these areas that Russia gained uh, control over and seized in 2014. So there, there's that element. Another objective is, is, is trying to get to Kyiv and taking Kyiv. My concern is you kind of look at, look at this to say nothing of the fact uh, in the South of expanding Russian control to try to block Ukraine's access to the Black Sea in totality is huge. You know, Americans are kind of relearning geography right now. And in the country next door to Ukraine, Moldova, Moldova is technically neutral, but there's a slip sliver of Moldova, another frozen conflict, conflict of an area called Transnistra, which is garrisoned by Russian troops. So your ability to kind of tie together all these different garrisons in movement makes the ability of prosecuting a war a little bit easier. Um, and, and, and last and certainly not least, your ability to encircle these major cities and then be able to bomb them into submission is similar to what we saw in Grozny and the Chechnyan war in the late 1990s. And unfortunately, what we saw in Syria with the bombing of Aleppo. The other aspect of, the, of this bombing, what it does is you weaponize wartime refugees, right? So 2015, the heavy Russian bombing in Syria 
was a huge challenge to European unity in the idea of a borderless Western Europe. It, it significantly impacted the domestic politics of these countries and really caused a huge crisis for the EU. You could see something similar going forward right now. The challenge that I see in the long term is how do countries like Poland, like Slovakia, who are doing amazing things to welcome in, now I think the estimates are up to 2 million uh, wartime refugees. What does that look like six months from now, seven months from now? What will be the demand signal be on public policy institutions and mechanisms to make that sustainable while this resistance fights back over time to regain Ukraine for Ukrainians? So Luke, and I, I wanna to turn to you now, now that Scott's introduced Western nations. Um, our, our principal response has been rhetorical, to be clear, to be certain, uh, objecting to the, the sort of moral disgrace of this. Um, the militarization of, of European powers, uh, Germany perhaps most significantly, um, and the supplying of armaments to Ukraine. But also, um, and this is the one that's been given sort of the most treatment over the last few, few news cycles, is uh, economic sanctions, uh, which have just increasingly ratcheted up. Um, I, as someone, again, who studies Russia and knows its history, Maybe you could walk us through what the intent of those sanctions are and how likely they are to succeed given the given the targets in in Russia. Um, well, I think you know it's useful to kind of put these sanctions very much in context, you know, of a situation in which Russia has for the last thirty years um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union become increasingly and deeply integrated into the European economy. The obvious one is energy, but also the banking system. I mean, Russia, you know, just, you know, my own experience, I remember going in the 1990s to, to museums in Paris, and it was the first time I saw translations of these, you know, the, 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 form, the sort of the, the kind of, right, the forms you get when you go into a museum were in Russian. So, and so and suddenly they had sort of Italian, French, you know, whatever, and then Russian. And so I feel like, you know, Russia became, has be, in a sense in the 1990s became a European country. And everybody sort of initially thought was, well, that's a good thing because that's a way for us to transmit our values to them. But of course, what we've discovered is all, there's also a flip side, which is that you know, it becomes that much more costly for us to sanction them. And I think that was the fear that many people initially had was that given the fact that you know, something like 50% of, uh, of energy of Germany comes from, from Russia, and the like in you know, Italy and other places that there would be a tremendous resistance to sort of imposing severe sanctions. Um, and you know, that is partly why I think Putin went in because he, he sort of took that for granted. He thought, well, look, the European Union has been incredibly divided um, you know, with Brexit and with the Eurozone debt crisis. I mean, this is sort of a model of dysfunction and um, so we're just, I'm just gonna go in and the Europe will start you know, bickering about this and, and nothing will ever really happen. But something really remarkable did happen. And you know, some people have attributed it to uh, Zelensky's um, speech at midnight where he said, this may be the last time you see me alive. I mean, that clearly affected people, but also the sort of, I think this was the first time you know, the, in which you have two core elements that sort of facilitated um, Right, quite extraordinary sanction response by Europe. The first is that this, if there's ever been a black and white conflict, this is one. This is the moral clarity, clarity of this conflict is stunning. You know, this was completely unprovoked. The second part is that suddenly Russia is clearly an existential security threat to Europe. Right? I mean, you know, mostly in Poland and, and, and you know, obviously in Hungary, which have a direct experience of being invaded by the by Russia, the Soviet Union. So I think, you know, we have a kind of mini Cold War kind of developing. And I think what this does in, on the positive end is it motivates real sacrifice on the part of European leaders to really do what is necessary to make it hurt for Russia. Uh, and I think that's hugely important. And we can, we can talk about the impact. The question is, what is the impact? So, you know, clearly it's been successful you know, the ruble has collapsed. They won't even open up the stock market. They're, they're terrified. You know, there's talk about, you know, sanctioning Russian oil. It's like, you know, we never thought we'd get there. Swift, the sort of ability to make bank transactions have ended. The question is, what, you know, why do we care, given the fact that you have literally someone who's mentally unstable, who's completely isolated, who clearly 
you know, it's very unlikely that in the short term he's going to be affected by this. I mean, I think there are two reasons um, is to, to why this is still could be a success. One is for the first time in, in modern Russian history, you have a real wedge being driven be, between the interests of the elite as a whole and Putin. So after 2014, there were you know some sanctions, but still, you know, Russia as an economic actor was able to function as normal. And this is really the first time, you know, we're sort of in uncharted territory. So you know, one hopes for a sort of a coup that's still very unlikely, but it's at least possible in a way that it wasn't two weeks ago. So Scott, I want to turn to you. Some have described the, the ratcheting up of the economic sanctions, which were in place. There were sanctions in place after 2014, the invasion of Crimea. But these are of a different order and character. Um, and in particular, they've, as, as Lucan was said, they've been infected in, in really causing economic pain in, in Russia. Russia had established a pretty um, generous sovereign wealth fund to try and make themselves impervious to sanctions. But um, the US and Western powers have found ways to skirt those exiting Russian banks from the SWIFT system and, and others. And some have characterized the, the package of sanctions as a nuclear attack in economic terms. And some of the language coming from Putin suggests that he is interpreting as such. Is that a fair characterization? And how significant are this, this particular sanction regime? So, so, so this is a good question. I mean, I, I, as, as we've been saying, this is a landmark shift in the way that Europe has engaged with Russia. So uh, many of the different areas that people saw as red lines that would not, would not be crossed have been crossed and it's changing the calculation of how these European countries are gonna engage with Russia going forward. So a great example would be Germany. So for the longest of time, whenever there was the question of brinksmanship with Russia, the, the question of whether or not the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which would send energy from Russia around Poland into Germany, would, would kind of would, 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 would be touched. And in fact, the Germans, surprisingly to many, said, we're not going to engage with Nord Stream 2. And even though we know this will cause significant, significant economic disruption within Germany. The other thing that you had happening, too, is a marriage of geoeconomic considerations driving new geopolitical calculations. So the new chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, a week ago made this landmark speech where he said for the first time really since the end of the Cold War, Germany was going to spend in excess of 2% of GDP on defense, the so-called NATO standard, something equivalent to $150 billion dollars. And this is an individual whose party has really kind of engaged Russia from time to time and sits on a coalition that, that never would have talked about these things. But as we're saying, this invasion is a major, major change in the shift of geopolitical dynamics, not just regionally in Europe, but globally. Um, and so I do think that these are very, very strong economic measures. And what I think the other thing we have to think about too, Trevor, is not just what we see the public sector and what's happening within our diplomatic circles to engage economic instruments that are controlled by the state, but what's happening in the private sector and how the private sector is responding to this. It was all over the news yesterday that McDonald's is gonna suspend operations in Moscow. And as many of you who've ever been to Moscow and go to Red Square, at the end of Red Square, you can go and walk and see the first McDonald's that opened in the early 1990s. And so, I just use that as an illustrative example of how it's not just governments that are reacting in, in an economic sense, but what's happening in international trade. For me, the long-term question is how long will domestic political constituencies, not just in our country, but in other countries, stomach the cost of these major significant disruptions of global supplies? And, 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 and can, can we wait this out? Who is time on the side of? Is it, on, is it on time on the side of Russia? or is the time on the side of the West? Let's, let's let me, Luke, it looks like you wanna weigh in there. So I'll, I'll let you weigh in and then I have a follow-up for you. Okay, great. So I just wanna sort of reiterate that as a concern, I mean, this is a marathon, this is not a sprint. I do worry about sort of, you know, it's easy in this first flush of these weeks to sort of in, with a shock and awe, the outrage is highest to sort of engage in these kind of activities. One does wonder sort of how long is, is uh, are Europeans willing to sort of put up these sacrifices? I will say, however, that in a sense, 
we are helped by um, Russia's strategy, which is you know to obliterate these you know these massive humanitarian acts that you know you know you know bombing hospitals. I mean, the more he engages in this kind of activity, you know. Um, it, it will clearly sort of remind Europeans that they have a real security stake in this conflict. It's not just Ukraine, it's, it's Russia in the world and something that really directly affects their lives. So that's, you know, the one way of hope is that they, will, they won't sort of forget um, the long-term implications of this conflict. Well, well Luke, in my, my follow-up, and it's, it's amplified by a question that's been offered by the, um, by the audience, is walk us through then the, the equivalent of the Russian population. What's the, how long can they hold firm? And, and what's the likelihood that their identity as Russians, as opposed to Europeans perhaps, and their fealty to Putin, how, how do we anticipate that the sanctions will, and, and other um, pressures will, will influence that dynamic? Well, that's the million dollar question, right? And that's something we don't know yet. I mean, there's, you know, as you can imagine, there aren't a lot of Great polls yet? I mean, uh, public opinion polls. It's very, you know, I think, you know, more so than ever before. Responses to polls are going to be affected by fear. We just, so we don't really know. Um, there has been one Levada poll, which is in um, conducted, which is connected February twenty eighth to March first. Um, you know, I think it shows sort of sixty five percent of of Russians thought that this action was in the interest of Russia. Which on one level seems high, another level is a pretty modest rally around the flag effect. If you think of sort of Crimea in that context, um, you also have this other element, which is you know of where a lot of obviously Russians have personal connections to Ukraine, and so that's what makes this uh, conflict distinctive. And I think in that sense, it becomes much harder uh, to sort of completely block out information. Um, from Ukraine, and so it makes it hard for them to hide it because people have this is like where their their, their grandmas live, right? <laughs> um, you're bombing grandma's apartment, essentially, and so you know I can't imagine you know he's going to be able to hide that the way you can sort of hide sort of what's going on in Grozny and in Chechnya and, and Syria. Um, on the other hand, you know we just don't know, and uh, Putin, you know, has his average, uh, I quote unquote, average support has been in the 70s. Right, and so it's, it's you know he has a big base, but it, you just don't know how long that's going to last. So this is moving now into part two, which is more the sort of geopolitics of this. Although we'll we'll stay we'll start by staying in the region. Um, this is a question for both of you, but we'll start with you, Scott. Um, so we we were on the one hand all surprised by Russia's in, invasion. On the other hand, there's a story that could be told about how there are clear signals about preparation from. Crimea to well Georgia and Ossetia before that and and Syria um, and then the Crimean Peninsula and the Donbass and, and other areas. So some have made the argument that this is the return of Russia as a geopolitical superpower. What's your assessment? So so Trevor, this is a great great question. I what I would say and I would offer is that Russia never went away as a great power. They were a latent power. They had significant challenges in the 1990s, uh, but but the actual potential of Russia was always there. Um, and, and I would argue the same hat, same with the way that we think about China. So for the last 20 years, while the United States and the West has focused and with legitimate reasons on countering violent extremism in the Middle East and other parts of the world, America's adversaries and competitors looked for weaknesses, looked at where, where there were issues within the West, tried to find opportunities and I would argue for the last 10 years or so, you've seen that limit testing. You, you saw it in 2014 in the Donbass. You see it in the South China Sea today. You see it in the cyber realm. And, and it, it was on a trajectory where I think you would get to the point where you would see an invasion like Ukraine because there hadn't been any significant rollback. Um, and, and, so, and so that's where I really kind of see this playing out um, Russia has, has always uh, identified itself as a great power, regardless if it was the Soviet Union, if it was Tsarist Russia, uh, other different kind of combinations. I think the other thing that is imp important to think about, if we look at the grand kind of stretch of, of Russian history, at least for the few, last few hundred years, change has always followed significant military defeats or reversals, reordering of Russian society, 
reordering of the elites. And, and, you know, I was talking to someone about how, you know, the, the, the October revolution wasn't really fomented immediately by the Bolsheviks, but the Bolsheviks were the ones who co-opted the revolution and ended up obviously uh, cha- taking Russia into the direction of the Soviet Union. Um, but that was because of just how, in part how poorly Russia did in World War I. So, and, and the same could be said about weaknesses shown in the Soviet model uh, a, a, on the heels of Afghanistan. Um, but we always have to know that Russia is a big country. It has a lot of resources. It sits at what uh, the great geostrategic theorist Halford McKinder called the heartland, the geostrategic kind of pivot of the greater Eurasian landmass. That has not changed and it did not change when the wall came down and the Soviet Union disappeared. Lucan, what's your perspective on, you know, return of Russia as a power or, or as, as Scott said, a, a latent power that's, that's always been that way? Well, I have a couple of things to say about that. First of all, um, I think, you know, I, before my answer, I want to sort of, you know, state, which I think should be obvious, that this was not inevitable. That I think there's a, a little bit of a tendency of ex post. So you look back in Russian history, you see expansions. You know, in the, I've heard some people say on the radio, this was sort of inevitable you know, that Russia was going to invade because of, of historical ties. This was Putin's decision. And everything we know is that this was a tr- about the Russian power structure, which is not much, was that this was an incredibly controversial decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think, you know, without sort of a, a situation in which Putin has, you know, s- enormous policy discretion within the Russian elite, I, I don't think you would have seen this kind of risky, in, you know, invasion. I mean, there's, you know, a, lo- a lot of Russian generals, you know, had some anticipation of what would happen. Um, in terms of the return of great power, I think on the morning of, you know, the night of February 24th, when it first happened, I think that was the really question because this could have gone in a very dark direction. If Russia had been easily successful and sort of done it without facing costs, you could have seen sort of, you know, a situation which that encourages his actions to sort of further expand into Europe. It also encourages uh, China with regards to Taiwan, right? But I, instead, you know, thankfully, what you've seen is, I think, in some ways, the opposite, which is that, first of all, um, you know, the action was enormously costly, um, which means that, like, no one is going to want to follow Putin's example, <laughs> right? Um, and so this has actually been, a, you know, I think, you know, very good in that sense. And furthermore, it's going to dramatically weaken uh, Russia as a ge- geopolitical force. Force. I mean, I think you know. You're right. There are sort of you know. He still be, it will always be a big country. It will always have natural resources. It'll, you know, almost certainly have a big army. In that sense, that's constant. But um, relative to what it was three weeks ago, I mean, you can. I'm almost certainly Europe is going to become much less dependent on Russian energy. Um, you know, we've already seen the sort of the army has been discredited. Um, you know, and, and I see a real kind of weakening of Russia's geopolitical power, at least in the short and medium term. Scott, Lucan just mentioned and mentioned earlier too, uh, Europe's broadly its dependence on Russia for energy and and other natural resources, but energy in particular in Germany, you mentioned the Nord Stream um, pipeline. What are the pathways for Europe to disentangle from that Russian dependence and, and sort of timeline that for us? It's obviously not the flip of a switch, but you know, what are the stages by which Europe could disentangle its energy markets and other, um, other trade relations with Russia? This is a great question and it's, and it's timely because just yesterday, Ursula von der Leyen, the, the head of the European Union announced a new policy that by 2030, the EU will be completely no no longer reliant on Russian energy. Now to do that, we'll take uh, an approach of of, of obviously diversifying where it gets energy from, but what types of energy. So for example, one of the questions being asked right now is will there be some countries in Europe that are gonna be more willing to entertain nuclear energy in ways that they haven't been? So for example, another country we haven't talked about much so far, but has, has, has been a major, uh, a major factor here as well is France. So France relies heavily on an independent nuclear energy capability, uh, partially for this reason, to not have uh, over-reliance. Um, a country that's, that is of Europe, but not part of the European Union anymore, um, the United Kingdom has announced that by the end of this year, they will no, no longer import any energy sources from Russia either. Now, as a percentage, it's not the 30 or 40 percent 
of maybe what like a Germany or um, the Netherlands currently has, but you'll see that you'll see that slowly over time, I believe. But this is going to have this is going to cause some trade-offs. Um, you know, there will be you know the green movements and others who will want to see kind of a, a change in energy consumption are, are going to have to make some tough choices, right? Because the convenience of of some of the fuel that they're going to be getting is not going to be as easy as it was before. Um, and what does that mean for cost? How does that impact manufacturing? Um, does that create new vulnerabilities long term? Uh, almost immediately after BP, Shell, and others said they were going to divest their 15, 20% holdings in, in Russian, Russian oil and gas, and gas companies. companies. China's, China's now saying, saying that they're interested, interested in buying, buying those. Right. So, so how does, how the, does West the West ensure that the, the way in which they engage and think, think about, about geopolitically with Russia, Russia not, not come, come at the cost of a longer term systemic, systemic challenge, challenge of what, of what you could have in China. So Luke and Scott just mentioned China, and you mentioned China earlier. There's been considerable reporting on how Russia's invasion of Ukraine has strained its new partnership with China. Others have characterize that relationship as highly asymmetrical with Russia on the pathway to becoming a vassal state of China. How do you characterize that, that relationship and how do you see events obviously unfolding in real time, uh, influencing that relationship? Well, I think that's a you know, really you know, essential question. I mean, you know, uh, China is obviously, as much as the world has sort of united against Russia, China is the, you know, the big uh, country that has not. And, and, I, and, and I, you know, she has, you know, clearly invested a lot in the relationship between himself and Putin. Um, it's not, frankly, entirely clear to me what the basis of this, you know, relationship is materially. I mean, clearly, there's sort of an, an ideological anti-Americanism, which is, you know, rooted in this, you know, in this friendship. Um, but, you know, uh, on the other hand, um, you know, Russia is a pretty small economy, and the the Chinese economy relies extensively on Western inputs that Russia cannot replace. And I think to the more to the extent that you have these sort of sanctions, it really kind of puts a strain within the Chinese elite. I mean, you saw, I mean, some people noticed a very kind of bizarre incident where I think it was a, about a week or two ago when a billboard in front of the Canadian embassy, a very official pro-Ukrainian pro billboard appeared in, in, on the street in front of the Ukrainian embassy in Beijing, and believe me, nothing like that's going to happen without some official okay. And so, you know, everybody's like, you know, what is going on? I mean, there's clearly, you know, we don't know what's going on in within the Chinese elite, but there's clearly conflict. And I think a lot, you know, you know, in terms of how this conflict ends will depend on sort of what happens, you know, in this debate within the Chinese elite, because if the Chinese elite is really interested in a settlement, they are in a position to really enforce Russia more than anything else to, 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 to you know, force Putin to do this. I mean, you know, the, as you alluded to, you know, China's economy is 10 times the size of Russia's. Um, you, know, you know, Putin will, you know, in the context of sanctions, will really be unable to survive without uh, Chinese support. So I think we're all sort of waiting to sort of see how that debate plays out uh, within the Chinese elite. Let's let's talk about another major player. Scott, I want to come back to you. And now we move into the multilateral world. Uh, so NATO, um, a four-letter acronym we hadn't, hadn't thought about much um, until recently. Um, so Germany's pledging to, to militarize, and you laid out why that's so, so important. Uh, it's also noteworthy that both Sweden and Finland have begun to say uh, we are reconsidering our relationship to NATO. Uh, the Baltics are already part of NATO, so there's a there's another geographic region at play where Russia has a considerable amount of security concerns. What's the likelihood of future conflict that becomes a direct conflict between NATO countries and and Russia? So, so this, so is, this a great, is a great uh, great question. question. I, 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 I I think the idea, the idea is, is and President, and President Biden's Biden's been very very, very clear. clear. That, that defending NATO, NATO is sacred, 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 sacred. That's that's that's, that's the, ultimate, the ultimate the red, the red line, line, right? Right. And you're, and you're seeing, seeing that, that with the United, United States, States and other NATO, NATO countries, countries are, are distributing, distributing forces, forces along, along that, that eastern, eastern flank, flank. Uh, from, uh, from the from Baltics, Baltics into, into Poland. Poland. It was just it was announced just today that we're increasing our increasing increasing missile, missile presence, presence in Eastern, Eastern Europe. Europe. And so, and I, so think I think as long as both leaders are kind of clearly communicating 
uh, where, uh, those, where those red, red lines, lines are. are. The, 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 the odds of having, having an outright, outright war between, between Russia, Russia and NATO, and NATO are great, 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 but it doesn't but it mean it's, it's impossible, impossible, right? right? Leaders, Leaders miscalculate all the time. All the time. And so, and so both, both what, what I, I call kind of, kind of vertical, vertical, um, vertical or horizontal, horizontal escalation, escalation can be can a major, be a major concern. concern. It's one of the one reasons, reasons why the United States, States I, believe, I believe, was not, was not supportive, supportive of this idea, idea of Poland, Poland giving, giving their, their advanced, advanced fighters, fighters to Ukraine. Ukraine. That, that being, being seen as maybe much, much too escalatory. Uh, to, uh, your, to your question, question about Sweden, Sweden and, and Finland, Finland, you know, the, you know these, these are two countries who are who have partnered with NATO, NATO in, the, in the past, past they're not NATO, NATO members, members, but they're, 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 they're NATO, NATO partners, in other words, they have a seat at the table, table in Brussels, in Brussels when, NATO when NATO has discussions. But without, but without a doubt, this, this conflict has unified, unified NATO, NATO in ways we have, have not seen, seen since 9-11, which is our audience, audience, the only time that Article, Article 5 of NATO, NATO so the collective defense kind of, kind of mechanism, mechanism for this, for this defensive, defensive political, political nuclear, nuclear alliance, alliance was triggered, was triggered after, after 9-11. So, so by an attack, attack that happened, happened outside, outside of, Europe, of Europe on American, on American soil. soil. Um, um, and so it's, so it's going to be very, very interesting, interesting to see where NATO, where NATO goes. goes. In, a few, in a few months, months Na the, the next, next NATO, NATO summit, summit is going to be held, held in Madrid, Madrid Spain, 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 at which, at which NATO, NATO is going to release their new strategic concept. This is this the first time that NATO will have released a new strategic concept since 2009. And as we're seeing, the world has obviously radically changed in the last 11 years. Scott, I'm, I'm afraid we're getting some feedback on your audio. If you if you wouldn't mind logging off and logging back on, that might uh, might correct that. Um, so forgive uh, audience, forgive me for the for the the disruption, but um, hopefully that that will become clear here in a minute. Luke and I'd be interested in in your thoughts on the significance you were mentioning earlier the the emerging cohesion of 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 NATO. What do you see as the likelihood of, of a conflict between NATO and, and Russia? And you're, you're muted. Uh, sorry. Um, yeah, so I, I think that is, you know, a real concern. And, and um, you know, there was a lot of talk, uh, you know, recently about a no-fly zone. And you can certainly understand why the Ukrainians want there to be a no-fly zone. Um, but at the same time, there's the obvious fact that, you know, no-fly zones have been applied in contacts in, you know, Iraq and, uh, and Bosnia, you know, against much weaker militaries. And I think that's why, you, you know, the, the West is right to be careful. And I, I do worry about, um, you know, inadvertent, um, contest, you know, confrontation. I mean, I, I'm guessing, although we never know that Putin's not going to invade the Baltics, um, but, you know, he, short of that, you know, you could imagine a situation in which the the Russians are targeting supply lines from Poland and inadvertently go into NATO airspace or inadvertently bomb sort of a NATO, you know, truck or something like that. So, you know, there are many, you know, opportunities for, for inadvertent escalation. And I, and I think it's, it's right um, to be concerned because I think, you know, one thing I've learned in studying your Eastern Europe for 30 years is that it can always get worse. And we should not forget that as awful, you know, as, as it is now, there are so many ways in which this could, you know, conflict could get much, much worse. So Scott, let's see if your, your audio has improved as I ask you this question. Um, what, what more or differently should the, the United States be doing? And I should point out that you're no longer in your role of, of providing that direct strategic guidance. So hopefully you have a little bit more freedom to, to offer uh, a, a more candid view. What, again, do you think the United States can and should be doing to influence this, this uh, series of events? So Trevor, uh, thanks for the question. Hopefully the audio is- uh, Audio is sounds great. Okay. So I, I think what the United States should continue to do is a lot of what we're already seeing, which is a major, major emphasis on diplomacy and the reliance on allies and partners to provide a cohesive and unified front against Russia's provocation, first off. Second, I think that the United States is from, uh, from a domestic sense is President Biden will have to continue to kind of give these fireside chats, if you will, on the costs that Americans are gonna to have to absorb, maybe at, mostly at the gas line, but also in other areas to sustain this effort. Something that Lucan talked about as well. This is a marathon, it's, it's not a sprint. Uh, 
Um, I, I think the other thing that the United States uh, will have to think about from a military perspective is how much does this current issue, this crisis, change the way that the national security establishment was thinking about our national security strategy. So every administration, when they're elected and take over the White House, they create their own unique national security strategy and a national defense strategy and kind of what the Pentagon does. So if this is gonna be a long-term slog, how do we ensure that America's military footprint with our allies and partners forward is sustainable and doesn't do to us what's happening to Putin's military right now, which is getting fixed in a certain area, moored in not having freedom of action to think about other major ge geopolitical issues from the Indo-Pacific to the Middle East, which is still relevant to obviously things that we don't talk about enough in my opinion, but much more closer to home, security and stability in the Western hemisphere. So Lucan, we've, we've got a question from the audience. Uh, do you think Ukraine fully realizes the need to recognize all who are fleeing Ukraine, uh, especially those of color? Um, I think, uh, all I, can, I don't know about the Ukrainian government. I think it's, it, it is you know, clear that there were some problems. I'm not sure of the extent of with where you know medical and other students you know of African of African descent had trouble um, crossing the Polish border that is completely unacceptable and we just have to sort of you know recognize that and absolutely I just I don't know what the scale is but yes um, it's this, this is you know an important issue which we must recognize and ensure that that doesn't happen again. Thank you for that good question and then and the response, Luke. And I want to turn to the third chapter now in the 10, 15 minutes we have remaining, which is the sort of future of liberal governance. So I'll come back to you, Luke. And you what's the you were mentioning earlier that there is a scenario under which um, there is a coup and, and Putin is removed. Talk about the likelihood of regime change in Russia. And and if that were to come to pass. What do you think Putin's exit from the scene would mean for the trajectory of Russia? Well, a couple of things. I think coups are always unlikely. Um, you know, I think you know as much as I sort of would love there to be kind of mass revolt, and then I mean, oftentimes what happens historically is that coups are in the context of popular unrest, and so in a sense, the most plausible scenario in a, you know, might be a context where you have severe economic you know, uh, discontent, protests, and then sort of forces around Putin kind of use that as an excuse to sort of have a coup. Um, I think it's, you know, pretty unlikely. It's definitely impossible. It's not something you definitely want to re rely on. Um, I, and I think in the short term, if that did happen, I mean, given the cost of war, I think it's almost certain that that would sort of, you know, contribute to a peaceful settlement of the conflict. A separate question is whether that would lead to democracy in Russia, and I think that's you know much less unknown. I think um, you know opposition in Russia is still very weak, and that I have much less certainty of. Um, but yeah, but certainly I think you know that is in a sense I think our best hope um, of, of a kind of peaceful solution is that you know is a kind of uh, some sort of coup in Russia. I want to then also talk about sort of its broader implications for the liberal West. I mean. This invasion has occurred in the context of what I would, you know, think of as a real kind of democratic malaise for the last 10 or 15 years with the rise of populists, you know, in Hungary and Poland, um, you know, Russia interfering in the in the US election in 2016, Russia becoming increasingly active in elections in Western Europe. Um, and until now, you've had a sort of muddled response, right? You had, you know, people who I admire, like uh uh uh, Merkel in, in, in Germany kind of facilitating Hungary within the European Union to the European People's Party, sort of ensuring that, you know, Orban wasn't punished. And so you really had a sort of, in, as well as sort of massive dysfunction within the European Union. And I think, I think my sort of, the optimist part of me says, well, this might be kind of the jolt to the liberal world that we really need to sort of remind people of why these values are important. And so far, the signs are incredibly encouraging. I mean, you have a unity and sense of purpose that you just simply have not seen within Europe in I don't know how many decades. And so I think this may, you know, ironically on the night of, as I said, on the night of February 24th, I was thinking, you know, this could have gone in a very dark direction. And I think we at least see the possibility that we could actually see 
you know, this is as an inflection point leading to the reinvigoration of the liberal, you know, the liberal world. So Scott, I want to ask you the same question, but in a different way. So Lukin's given us the more hopeful perspective about what could come. What if Russia were to quote unquote succeed in Ukraine and establish itself as a controlling power over Ukraine and, and, and Europe begins to, to you know, retrench a little bit from, from its, the immediacy of the conflict. What do you see as the potential impact on the, the sort of liberal world order that Lucan was describing? So in many ways, I, I agree that even if Russia is, is some nominally successful in a conventional military sense, this has still buttressed the West and democracy, I think, globally. And the reason why I think you, you I also believe this is while we've talked a lot about Europe, you've seen a lot of democracies in the Asia Pacific region coming out and being very, very vocal. Japan, South Korea, Australia, just to name a few. Um, in, in seeing this an attack on a, on, a, on a political system that many have taken for granted, but as we said earlier, is, is, is definitely worth, worth fighting for. So let's let's talk about the United States and our and our role in this. Um, so, you know, we're we're certainly and you uh, to this point, both of you have mentioned the United States, but largely it's been a conversation about Europe and its relationship with with Ukraine and with Russia. But we've obviously been an active participant in that part of the world for for decades, um, and you know, Russia has long signaled its fear of NATO's you know, emergence right on its border. And, and we have been unclear, um, uh, particularly with regard to Ukraine. So we've played a role to some degree in contributing to Putin's paranoia. Um, and also at various times in our recent history, we have pronounced that democracy is the end of history, essentially, that, that it is the way the world should move. And we, under the uh, George W. Bush administration, he was very prominent in saying that US foreign policy should be to promote democracy abroad. In more recent years, we've stepped back from that, that commitment. I'd be curious to each of you, what would your guidance be to the United States, its leaders and its, its citizenry about that role of the United States in promoting democracy and that liberal uh, order around the globe? We can start with you, Lucan. Well, a couple of things. First of all, I wanna say something brief about NATO. I think this discourse that somehow NATO is responsible for the invasion. I'm not saying that you were saying that, but a lot of people are. A lot of people um, are. Yeah. Um, is that um, I think this is clearly, I think in my view, this is clearly a red herring. Um, you know, Russia had already precluded NATO membership by occupying portions of Crimea. Um, you know, and it's really unimaginable. I don't know what Scott thinks that NATO would have, you know, incorporated a country in which you had contested international borders with a major nuclear power. And so that was already, in my view, off the table to begin with. You know, I think NATO is simply sort of an excuse to sort of put the West on the defensive. Um, and sorry, what was your, your the question what, was- what should, what should the United States role be in promoting democracy and the liberal world order? I think we went through a period in which that was sort of stated policy. And in the last two presidential regimes in particular, Obama and Trump, we started to step away from that, that full-throated commitment. What's your sense of what, what that role should be for the United States moving forward? I'm of two minds, because you know, I think you know, I, I graduated from university. I think we were, we were in cave, cave together in the 1990s. It was the height of the sort of optimism around democracy promotion. I think, unfortunately, the invasion of Iraq for you know, fair and unfair reasons really discredited the whole notion of democracy promotion. Um, and I do think that, you know, I do think that one, it is important to sort of uh, to, to reinvigorate that. I think you know, democracy is truly a universal value. It's you know, people it's shared by a large portion of the population. At the same time, I think we have to approach it with a much greater degree of modesty than we have in the past. I mean, rather than sort of the old 1990s model that we knew, Trevor, of sort of we have the right answers here, you adopt our. Um, what we think is the you know the right answer. It's it's more about a discussion of a common problem. You know we have in the United States have I'm in Canada, but um, I'm from the United States um, that we have you know issue with, with democracy they're trying to work out and let's sort of have a dialogue about how to sort of make democracy work. So it has to be yes you need democracy promotion, but it also has to be much more sort of 
modest and dis discourse oriented in the back and forth than it has been in the past. So Scott, I'm gonna turn the question to you and, and ask you to look at this through the frame, the frame of, of your role as, as a, a former military advisor. What, what does the future of the, the world look like from a geopolitical strategic sense if the world is promoting democracy and expanding it versus contracting? Well, this is, this is a good question. I, I kind of see in, in really, if we would have had this discussion in the midst of the, of the coronavirus pandemic, I would have given you the same answer, which is you're having really kind of two emergent camps or philosophies of governance and economics. The United States kind of led Jeffersonian pluralism with laissez-faire economics versus state-driven, more control of society model that we see from, from you know, Russia and definitely from China. And so COVID-19 in many ways kind of just amplified great power competition. You're seeing that play out right now with how, how countries are kind of, I, I hate to say it, but taking sides and figuring out what does Ukraine mean in and of itself, but also what does it mean for their own forms of government? Um, you know, there's a, the famous uh, phrase from Richard Haas, the president of the Council on Foreign Relations, that foreign policy begins at home. And I think if we looked at the events in the United States in 2020, you know, the, one of the points we discussed earlier, we, we definitely have a, a democracy deficit that we have to strengthen and uh, at home. And, but also when we think about how democracies work to wor work with each other, and you're, you're seeing that happen. So the United States' greatest asset, and really the West's greatest asset, is the constellation of alliances and partnerships that we have. And those are built on trust and mutual respect and common interests. So there is an instru instrumental utility of democracy that matters in geopolitics, right? It's something that we can't divorce ourselves from. There's a reason why certain countries that are not kind of part of that cluster together and do not have their own alliances, right? China doesn't have an ally. Russia doesn't have an ally. It has countries that 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 are influenced by them, right? We're seeing this right now with you know, the question of how much is Belarus gonna kind of concede to what Russia is asking versus kind of pushing back. Um, what's happening in other parts of uh, Asia as it relates to how China's interpreting things. So, so again, I, I think that no matter how this conflict ends, you're gonna continue to kind of have these competing global systems. The question is which ones are gonna be the most resilient? Which ones do people wanna see? They wanna have a future in for themselves, but also future generations and what's worth fighting for, right? The Ukrainians, it's absolutely worth fighting and dying for them. And many in the West are having to ask that question in ways that they have not had to since the early 1990s. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have. We could go on and I would love to go on for another hour in this really invigorating and informative conversation. So let me thank our panelists, Dr. Luke and Wei and Dr. Scott Smithson for helping us understand the crisis in Ukraine. It's been a really engaging uh, discussion and thank you all in the audience for your really informed and inquisitive questions. As soon as this program ends, a screen's gonna pop up and ask you to take a short survey about our dialogue series. Please take a moment to share your feedback and uh, help us improve future events. To that end, we hope you'll join on Tuesday, April 12th for our next virtual dialogue program on the great uh, resignation. Visit wosu.org backslash dialogue for program details and registration and photo gum. Thanks all and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.